Hi, I'm Jean-Pierre Talbot, SC for SonicWall in Canada, and in this video we do this step by step on how to configure SonicWall access point. First step will be to register those access points on SonicWall, then we'll look at requirement on the switch because I will set up four SSIDs, so we need VLAN tagging and the management to be untagged, so I'll cover that. Then we will also turn on all the features that I personally personally think need to be on for Wi-Fi to work at its best. If that's the type of video you like, please consider subscribing so you don't miss out on upcoming videos. So before we start, I want to do a Wi-Fi 101 basic and the do's and don'ts because many times I see people doing things that I find completely useless or they do things that will disable valuable features or just they shoot themselves in the foot. So let's get going with first the 101 on Wi-Fi and then the do's and don'ts. So Wi-Fi as of today, late 2022, you do have two frequencies you can use. 2.4 gigahertz that we've been using for 20 years and 5 gigahertz that is, well, less old. So it is two different frequencies. So you can use both at the same time without any issues. It's like if you had two people arguing next to you and you want to send an email. Well that arguing has no impact whatsoever on your ability to send an email, right? Because it's not, there is no interference between voice and email electronic and IP SMTP stuff. Unless the arguing get to a point where they throw chairs at you and you are in the path of the said chair, but that has nothing to do with Wi-Fi. So first is 2.4 gigahertz, then I'll talk five. So on the 2.4 gigahertz, that one in North America has 11 channel, where if you look at under other country, for instance, I believe China has 14 channel. So you may want to just Google uh, 2.4 gigahertz channel in your country. So you see all the channel are that are available in your country. But in North America, there are 11 channel and they all overlap with their neighbor. An overlapping channel is not good. Overlapping means you do have interference. That's like if you had two people talking at the same time, it's not working well. Or if you're in a bar in a very loud place and you're trying to have a, a conversation with your loved one, not going to work. It's super loud. You got people yelling or it's a concert. So, you know, you get the point. Interference is not good for Wi-Fi or for us. We cannot hear each other, right? So it's the same thing here. So when you have overlapping channel, it means that if you're on channel one and you're trying to have wireless working on channel one and your neighbor is on channel two. Well, channel two on 2.4 gigahertz overlap with channel one, which will make both wireless network not work quite good. So on 2.4 gigahertz, you have only three channel that don't overlap with each other. So channel one, channel six and channel 11. So those can all be used at the same time, right? Here I do have three access points. So this one could be on channel one, this one on channel six, this one on channel 11. And here I have an iPad and two laptops. So the iPad could be connected to the connecting here, one laptop here, another laptop there. It wouldn't be an issue at all. Even though they're super close to each other, they are on channel six, one and 11. They don't overlap, so no interference whatsoever. So that is what you generally want, right? Things to work well, no interference, so they can all work. And that is considering you do use 20 megahertz channel, right? Because let's say 2.4 gigahertz, the band available is this, right? So channel one will be here, channel two will be here. So it just overlap on top of the other, but you have channel one, six and 11. So if they don't overlap, uh, it's because they are on 20 hertz. So that wide. You can do 40 hertz, but that's twice the length. So that means that you actually on 40 hertz take two thirds of the available frequencies, which is one of the worst thing you can do because you only have one channel available without doing interference. So there is no way to have multiple access point and get some roaming working because if you have two access point, they will interfere with with each other if you do 40 hertz. So I'll show at I'll show that uh, when I configure it. But on 2.4 gigahertz, make sure you do 20 hertz only, and you do channel one, six, or eleven. Don't pick channel three 
because you will do interference with everyone on channel one and everyone on channel six. So you will pretty much screw up two thirds of the available frequencies on 2.4. So quite a bad thing to do. And also keep in mind, there is a load of things that work on 2.4. That's 2.4. That's on 2.4. That too. Oh, no, that's, that's wired. Um, RC cars, I play with RC cars with my son. The remote is on 2.4. So there is a load of things on 2.4 gigahertz, which will all create interference, right? So you don't know all of a sudden, everything works fine on 2.4 and it's lunchtime and the Wi-Fi dies. Well, it's because you got two microwave and they are on 2.4 as well. So generally speaking, there is a load of things on 2.4. That thing uh, here. That's a small, tiny camera. It's on 2.4 as well. So it's something to keep in mind. 2.4 is crowded and that all create interference. And now five gigahertz. So on five gigahertz, you do have way more available channel versus 2.4. And on top of that, those channel do not overlap with their neighbor. That means that if you have, I, I didn't do the count. You can find online, you can Google uh, five gigahertz channel with your country in Google image. You'll have a nice graph that explain all this, but there are probably 15, 20 available channel and you can use them all. They don't interfere with each other. So that's a great advantage of uh, five gigahertz. So you'd probably have 20 channel plus if you do 20 uh, megahertz channel. If you do 40, I believe you have nine. If you do 80, I wouldn't recommend going to 80. That's too much and you don't get a lot of channel. My personal preference is to either leave it to auto or put it at 40 uh, megahertz. That gives you a nice balance uh, between uh, performance and usability for roaming and having multiple channel available. So generally speaking, I do prefer five gigahertz, right? Because there is no this or that in the way that do interference with 2.4. Uh, so five is pretty much less crowded, way more available channel. They don't interfere with each other. So I personally really prefer five gigahertz, but of course here will in the access point here will configure both because I believe you should use both, right? 2.4 and five in, of course, in the event where you have very old devices that want to connect. So it's a good idea to offer them the ability to connect even if 2.4 is not the most desired frequency. And now let's move on to the do's and don't. Do that and don't do that. So the first don't do that is I often see people will duplicate the amount of Wi-Fi network they have. So they will say, uh, instead of just having guest Wi-Fi, they will have guest Wi-Fi 2.4, guest Wi-Fi 5 gigahertz. And the corporate Wi-Fi, they'll have corporate Wi-Fi 2.4, corporate Wi-Fi 5. So don't do that. I mean, personally, I don't think it's a good idea because First, that will kind of turn off the ability of the access point to move people away from 2.4 or balance between 2.4 and 5. You just kill this. And the last thing you want is to rely on the end user to make the judgment. Should I pick 2.4 or 5? Keep in mind, it's the same end user that calls you. They don't open a ticket. They call even though they know they should open a ticket, but they call and they say that the network is down because the printer is out of paper, right? So don't have an user make the judgment should they go 2.4 or 5. So I believe you should just do one SSID for guests and advertise it on 2.4 and 5. So the access point will have one SSID, people will see one SSID, but it will be on both frequencies. The same for the corporate Wi-Fi. So have corp Wi-Fi as the SSID and have it on 2.4 and 5. So that's the first one in part of the don't do this and do that. Next one would be to not mix Wi-Fi brand or technologies, right? Many times I got people calling, say, hey, I'd like to buy one access point because we have a wireless TZ firewall, but the, the wireless on the TZ is not strong enough to get to the other side of the, of the building. And they would say, you know, I'll keep the wireless TZ, but I'll add an access point at the other end. It will work, of course, it, things will not blow up and the air is not going to catch fire because you have two APs that are not the same sort of thing. But 
they will be managed differently. One will be managed through uh, the, the cloud Wi-Fi management. The other one is the TZ wire fire, firewall. So that's not going to work at its best. You know, both will work. People will be able to connect to both, but don't expect roaming to work quite well. And you may get to a point where it's, if someone moves from one side to another of the building, they may not be able to connect to the Wi-Fi because it's too far away. So you kind of get to disconnect, reconnect, it's going to re-ask you the password. So it's not going to be the best user experience. The same if you put any other brand of firewall, of access point, uh, whatever, if it's corporate or something you bought at a Walmart or something, and also have a Sonic wall. Those would be two brand of access point, two different management interface. So don't expect things to work super well in that case. So what I would advise is just if you have a wireless TZ and the signal is not strong enough, well, turn off the wireless on the TZ and buy two access point and you know have a good coverage with both access point. That would be a much better setup. And the last part I want to cover is on the do's and don'ts is the security aspect. Because many times I see again people doing things, I'm like, why are you doing this? Because to me, security wise, when you implement security, it shouldn't be much of a big deal for end user and quite a major pain for any hackers, right? Like 2FA, it's not that much of a deal for us to take our phone, open whatever Google, uh, Google, Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator or anything else and type in the 2FA code, right? It's a little bit of work, not that much, nothing crazy. But for hackers, it's a lot of work to defeat, right? So that's what you want. A pain for hacker, not much work for legit end user. So the first one I have been seeing a lot was to, to control who can connect on the Wi-Fi based on MAC address. So something to know is wireless encryption does not occur at the layer two of the OSI model where MAC address are. So that means that MAC addresses are sent in clear text on Wi-Fi, even though you have WPA3 encryption, for instance, MAC address will remain in clear text. So how much of a pain is it for a hacker to find out which MAC address are allowed? Dead easy. They just have to sniff the traffic for five seconds. They'll build a list of, of, of MAC addresses that are allowed on your side. And how much of a pain is it for you with with your employees that show up with a new laptop to pick the Mac and put it, it's a real pain. So that's the exact opposite it should be, right? Should not be easy for hacker and painful for users. Should be the other way around. Painful for hackers, a real joke for users. So doing Mac address filtering on Wi-Fi is, in my opinion, completely useless. Second one I've seen, I'm not a big fan of security through obscurity. Well, sometimes it can be better than nothing, but security wise, if your plan is better than nothing, it's not the best security either, right? So I've seen people say, you know what? I am going to disable the DHCP on my corp Wi-Fi, so people will need a fixed IP on their laptop. So that is quite a pain again. So you'll need to, kind of like MAC address filtering, you'll need to build a list of fixed IP addresses and input those into the NIC of the device. And if they happen to go at the Marriott, you need to teach them to put their NIC back on the HTTP. But when they come back, you open their notepad and input the, the right uh, epic nightmare. And for a hacker, how much work is it? I'm not quite sure if the MAC address is uh, the IP address is encrypted or not, but in both cases, it's a real joke. If someone managed to crack your wireless network, they are able to decrypt the packet. And if the IP address is encrypted or not, well, they'll find out, right? So you have created a delay of a split second for an hacker, and it's a huge pain for end users. So again, in my opinion, don't disable the HTTP on your Wi-Fi in the hope that it will make things more secure. It's not. Another one I've seen was to hide the SSID. They say, well, they don't see my wireless network, so I'm hidden. They're like, no, you're not at all. Every packet that are transmitted wirelessly from a device that is authenticated will contain the SSID name, and you don't even need to have cracked the wireless network. That SSID is visible in clear text. So 
again, a real joke for a hacker to find out what's your wireless network and a real pain for your employees. Like, okay, it's Corp Wi-Fi, Corp with a capital C, Corp space, Wi-Fi, Corp, capital W, lowercase i, dash, dash, or I, I know not, not iPhone, dash, like, oh. so a real pain. So again, hiding this SS, the SSID is pretty much useless security wise, in my opinion. Uh, web is another one. Uh, don't you don't do web. Uh, many vendor have already removed web as an encryption for wireless because it it has a flaw. And I've personally had my fair share of fun of cracking web keys, so it is super easy to defeat. Within 10-15 minutes, I could get it done. And I am not a hacker. I just load it, backtrack, and add fun. So it is something fairly easy to crack. Uh, WPA, I, I haven't checked on WPA, WPA3, but of course WPA have been cracked, WPA2 as well, and 3, I guess, eventually. Uh, but the, the thing to crack WPA, uh, to WPA and WPA2 was a dictionary attack, roughly. So you grab the, you de-authenticate the user, the user will re-authenticate, you grab those packets of re-authentication, and then you do a di dictionary attack to try to find out what was the WPA password. And if you've put God as a uh, WPA key, well, in a dictionary attack, God is probably the top five words that are tried, right? So it's going to be even quicker to crack WPA versus uh, WEP if you have a super weak WPA key. I'm not fully aware of WPA3, how it works, and what was the flaw of WPA2, but my point is put a long, decent WPA key, lowercase, hypercase, numbers, special characters, and put one that is like 16 character long. Yes, it will be slightly painful, but remember, you take your phone and you type in that key once. So how much of a deal is it going forward? It's not. I mean, you just show up with your phone at the office and it connects. So easy for user, a pain for hackers, and that's what we want. And now let's move on to configuring all those nice access points. So just like pretty much every single SonicWall product, first thing we will do is to register the access point in that case. So go to cloud.sonicwall.com. Yes, you could go straight to my Sonic Wall. That works, but I like cloud.sonicwall.com because it gives me access to my Sonic Wall, but also access to the cloud management interface of the access point. So log in. Here I already have created a YouTube tenant where I, in a previous video, I've configured the sonic wall switch we'll be using, um, but here we'll just go into my sonic wall to register the access point. So we already have the firewall registered, the switch is there as well, so we'll hit on register product here. Select in which tenant you want it, then enter a serial number, authentication code, and give it a friendly name you will find that uh, serial number, you'll find it on the cardboard box as well as underneath the uh, access point. Here, I will show you different ways to register uh, the, uh, the access point. Reason being, you know, when you have one firewall, many companies will have one, maybe two firewall. We do have different customers that do have hundreds and even some with thousands. But there are customers, of course, when you go with access point, chances are you'll get multiple access point and one firewall, right? That's very common. So bulk registration will be much more used, I believe, in the access point um, registration process. So of course you could go here if you only bought one or two access point, type in the serial number, authentication code, friendly name, and that's about it. Best, I believe, is to work with salespeople and distribution before buying them to try to get all the serial number authentication code of all the access points. So then you can download a template, which I have here. I uh, know I don't, I'll download it again. And template looks like this. So Sarah, that's, of course you remove those, right? But what you need for an access point is put serial number authentication code, give it a friendly name and which country it will, it will be used. And I already did one ahead of time. So I have a CSV, which I'll uh, open here. So see here, I will use that import to uh, imp activate uh, three access points. Actually, I'll do, I'll remove that one. I want to import one using a different method. 
So see here, I will have three access points. So I got the serial number, the authentication code, a friendly name that I've been uh, everything but creative and country. So those are, you know, here I do as an employee receive beta unit and the beta unit I got for the 621 was a US unit, not a Canadian unit. So in my case, I needed to uh, put the US country because that one was designed for US. But you know, in your case, you will receive the AP that are for your country. So just ensure you put your country in here. And if you are wondering, well, what is exactly the country, right? Was it Canada with a capital C or all in caps? Or is there a dash in the country name or anything? So just pick one access point and we will manually go through the process of registering that access point. But at the last minute, I'll just hit cancel. So this authentication code name I want uh, here and select country C. That's the country you need to put for that access point. So for me, it's Canada with a capital uh, C. So I'm just going to hit cancel on this. And here you just put the country, right? So I'll close this. I'm not going to save changes. Actually, yes, I will save changes because I did change something, right? I don't want that access point to register through this. I will do it a different way. So register product, pick the tenant, then import, uh, upload CSV for bulk registration. So I will import the CSV I just did. Upload. and it is currently registering them all for me. It's kind of nice to get something or someone to do all the work for you. And done, hit on close. Then you can close this. And in here in a few minutes, they will show up as being uh, all registered. There we go, just hit refresh and they are all here. Other way I want to show you is in the event where uh, you received all the access point, but you have no way to get all the authentication code. It's too late. It's something maybe you've been told you should have done before buying them or, you know, whatever the reason is, you have all the access point, you have 50 of them and uh, well, you don't feel like typing all the serial numbers. So then we'll scan the barcode behind the access point using our phone. So here I do have huge outdoor model if you're wondering what is that thing and so forth yeah i'll put a link in the description box down below i just did a box opening and torture test of that access point putting it into uh, the pool doing the uh, ice bucket challenge on it because it's hell bucket challenge uh 12 000 psi pressure washer so it survived everything so what you can do is to use the sonic express app of course, you log in to FA. Okay, first, then I will pick the tenant, my YouTube tenant. And at the bottom, I do have register. So hit on register, confirm, and then I can scan the barcode. And you scan the small QR code that is on the access point and it puts all the information for you. Serial number, authentication code. It put a friendly name that I will change. 4320. And continue. Select which country, Canada. So just confirm tenant, serial number, authentication code, whatever it is, it's scanned through the QR code, friendly name, it's an access point, of course, and Canada, and it register. Select zone, we'll pick the default zone, we'll cover zone later. And I do have the option to register another. And again, it's starting with trying to get the QR code. So we'll just stop that, we're good. And I do see my 432.0 being here. So two ways to register, uh, well, three ways to register your access point. First, you go here and you manually put the serial number and registration code, you type them in. If you have one or two, not that bad. 
Second, I like the app. It's pretty nice. You just scan the QR code and off you go. But if you do have a lot of them um, working with sales before to get the CSV, not the CSV, but all the serial number identification codes, so then you can put it in there is also uh, something nice to have. Now all the access points are registered. We have the switch, the firewall, and my four access point. Next is to uh, go into Wireless Network Manager, WNM for, so for short, to manage them. And that's why I like cloud.sonicwall.com. It's because I got that tiny arrow up here. Click on it, it goes down. I'm into my YouTube tenant and I got Wireless Network Manager here, which allows me to manage my switch and my uh, access point as well. And as you can see, all the other tiles are grayed out. It's because that tenant does not have firewalls, which could be managed here at the endpoint antivirus, uh, Office 365 security, and any other the other products. It's only that that tenant only have switches and access point that can be managed in the cloud. Yes, I do have a firewall, but I didn't put the license to manage it in the cloud, so we'll just manage it locally. So click on Wireless Network Manager. So we end up here. First thing we will do, as you can see, the one the thing that is online is currently my switch. So that is the switch we will be using. So I'll cover briefly the configuration I've done on it. If you are if you are wondering how did you do the config on the switch, how does it work? I want to know more. Well, I've done a video where I do all the configuration of the switch. So here we'll just review what I've done. And then also in that previous video, I covered everything you need to know about VLAN. So if you are confused when I show you all those VLANs everywhere and tag VLAN and untag VLAN, I suggest you pause here and you go see the video about the uh, switch configuration that again is in the description box down below. So that's the setup we're working with today. We have the firewall here with plenty of interfaces already configured. Uh, the management interface, that's an interface I use for the management interface of everything. So that's isolated from everything else because I don't want my network, let's say, to be compromised because someone in HR clicked their resume they shouldn't have clicked. But then Acker get access to the HR machine, but also to the management interface of my switch, my firewall, my access point, my VMware. So I like to have a dedicated network just for management purposes of management interface. Again, switch, firewall, APs, VMware, everything you may have in your network. So I will, of course, put the management interface of the access point on that subnet, 101010 10, network. Um, also, I do want a wireless network for my LAN so that employees that have their laptop wired or wireless are on the same network and get the exact same access. I want a guest Wi-Fi. I want a VoIP Wi-Fi because of course I'll have um, real VoIP phone that are wired, but I, let's say, have wireless VoIP phone as well. And another SSID will be for the, the warehouse because I got a warehouse with wireless barcode scanner. And I, again, I want that isolated because, again, if HR clicks a resume, they shouldn't have clicked, which turned out to be an infected PDF. Well, I want the warehouse to keep working because HR have no access to the warehouse stuff. So shipping and receiving in the business will keep going, which is kind of important. So I got one, two, three, four different wireless network. And if you look at the switch, it's going to be different VLAN. So the LAN is on VLAN 90. The VoIP is on VLAN 99. Uh, then I get the guest Wi-Fi, which is on VLAN 200 and warehouse on VLAN 100. So for the firewall, for the access point, to work right where the access point will have one network cable going to the switch so and i believe that's quite standard i've worked with other access points so the management of the access point the access point brand new will send a dhcp request on a on the network on tag so the management will be on a on tag vlan and each ssrd are on a tag vlan so we need our switch the switch port in my case 528 to have uh, the untag VLAN for management in my switch, which is VLAN 10. And then I'll need to tag uh, VLAN 100, 200, 90, and 99. And each one will go on one SSID. So that's a switch review that we've done. Next is to uh, add our access point to a zone. So we go into network hierarchy here. 
you can, if you want, have multiple location. It's pretty nice. It's designed to have multiple location. Each location, of course, you can add some. You can put them at a different uh, location on the map. You can create multiple zones. And in a zone, you do have switch and access point and or you, you don't have to have both. Uh, the first video, I only had a switch. And as you can see, that switch added switch policy with all its setting. But here today we'll be adding access point. So we click on that little plus sign here. We find all of our access point and hit on add. They're all offline because yes, they are not powered on at this moment. <clears throat> then here, CAP policy. There is a default policy. So all those access points that are into that zone will have to adhere to that uh, AP policy. So we'll go see what we have in there. So see, pretty easy to find AP policy. Where could that be? Well, under policy, it would make sense. And yep, here we go, AP policy. So of course you can have multiple, right? Because keep remember, I told you here, you could have multiple location. Each location can have multiple zones and each of those zones have an AP policy. So here you can create multiple policies if you'd like. In my case, we'll just keep it simple, right? Because it's the step-by-step uh, -step basic configuration of the AP. So we're not gonna go crazy with multiple location, multiple zones and policies and stuff. We'll just keep it simple. So we'll edit the default policy. As you can see, we do have plenty of settings regarding management firmware radios and stuff. We'll go through them in a minute. Uh, here we do have our SSID group. So what are all the SSIDs that will be into that default policy? And as you can see, SSID group here is here, right above AP policy. And we do have our default group. And here we can, again, add multiple group or just add SSIDs into that group or edit an SSID. So we'll do that in a second. I'll just go back into my AP policy and I'll show you the settings we have. So under system, you can change username and password. Uh, personally, when I really isolate the management of my stuff to one VLAN and no one has access to it, I kind of don't care about the having the default username password because even myself, I don't have access to it. I give no access to anyone in that network. So there is not much that can happen. I prefer this as a security. But if you don't want to do this, then of course, always a good idea to change username and password. Uh, firmware, here it's set to auto update. So if you don't like that and you prefer to, you know, let's say you have 50 access point, you prefer AP update to be off and you want to perform update yourself and test on one access point, you may want to turn that off uh, or just leave it on and it's going to update on the weekend. Radio. So here again, I'm not going to cover every single button. I may do another video eventually for advanced configuration of Wi-Fi. I will just cover what I personally like turning on and what I believe needs to be done. Um, on 2.4 and 5, so those are the two radios. So like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, uh, I'm not a fan of when people create an SSID like LAN 2.4 and LAN 5 where users get to choose if they want to go 2.4 or 5. I prefer to let the access point decide uh, on this. So here, something I remember reading somewhere, a beacon interval, you should have 100 millisecond per SSID. So in our case, one, two, three, we want four wireless networks. So let's do 400 and 400 here. A max client, something to keep in mind. So that's the maximum client on the 2.4 radio and here maximum client on the five gigahertz radio, you may want to increase this if you want. Uh, one feature I personally like RSSI threshold here. I like to turn this on and often I go at 85. So what is RSSI threshold? So what it does is there are devices like iPhone and laptops and so forth that, you know, let's say you have a floor plan and you have uh, 10 access point throughout the floor to give you good coverage. Some wireless devices like an iPhone may stick to an access point and don't want to give up. And even though that access point is really far, the signal is very weak and there is an access point working perfectly fine, like a couple feet away, but it doesn't want to connect to that access point a couple feet away. It want to stick to that access point with a very weak signal. So what we can do here is 
saying if the signal get below minus 85, the access point will just kick out the device, which will force the device to connect to a closer access point. Again, that be careful on that value. Uh, if you don't have a good wireless coverage throughout the floor and you put something like minus 75, well, maybe in one corner of the building, the signal will never ever be better than minus 85 yeah, that I've put here, for instance. Well, that device will never ever be able to connect, right? So be careful with this. Again, if this if you don't have a good coverage, you may want to stick with the minus 95 because it's there at the beginning. So that's a feature I personally like turning on. Um, next, mesh network. So that's in the event where you uh, cannot connect an access point with a network cable. So it's going to be mesh wirelessly, right? It's going to use one of its radio to connect to another access point and the other radio will be used to serve other. Uh, so that's not something I'll cover in that video, maybe another video later on. Same goes for SSL VPN, the access point could run net extender on it, right? If you turn this on net extender VPN, so you could have the access point, build a VPN to your sonic wall firewall or your SMA and use this as sort of a work from home solution or a, um, you know, whatever reason where you don't need to deploy a VPN client on the machines there. You just have the AP do that for you and devices connect to the access point. So that's there. I, there are there are your good use case where it works. Personally, I prefer to put either a firewall or put the VPN client and have the uh, dedicated e, um, dedicated uh, VPN solution from SonicWall, the SMA. Uh, I'll put again a link in the description box down below uh, on that work from home solution. Then you do have other settings here: RMM, wireless intrusion detection, 802.1ax. What else? Port setting, that was a nice AP that's been discontinued, but it was, it kind of added built-in switch in there, which was kind of cool. ALG stuff as an MP. So here, basic stuff, to be honest, all I do is, well, in a minute, we'll create our SSIDs. Uh, here in system, you may want to turn off auto upgrade if you don't like it, turn off the LEDs if you got someone that complained that the access point generate too much light. Um, radio beacon interval, 100 millisecond per, um, per SSID, be mindful of maximum client that is set here um, and RSSI threshold that I like to turn on as well. So that's pretty much all I do in that menu. So we'll hit OK on this. Next, we'll go set RSSID because remember, I'll show you again, network ER key, we've added our access point into that zone here. That zone is using the AP, the default AP policy, which is what we just set here. And that AP policy is using this SSID group. So SSID group are into SSID policies. And as you can see, that's the SonicWall SSID that is there by default. So what we will do, uh, we'll create the four SSIDs that we want in here. So we'll first edit the SonicWall one that is there by default. We'll name it LAN. We could, if we want, have a schedule so the access point will only be usable at a specific time range. Again, we have the maximum client we could set for that SSID, which is kind of nice. Authentication, we got plenty of WPA, WPA2, 3, and as you can see, WEP is not uh, there anymore. SonicWall removed it because it's well known for not being secured for many years. And here you set the password. By default, the one I have here is password, works for me. Um, my At the beginning, I showed like uh, these little tricks. So see here, I had SSID, I mentioned, not a good thing, doesn't bring much value, but if you want to do it, it's there. VLAN, so here, again, remember I told about VLAN. So this SSID will be on a specific VLAN when it reached the switch, and the switch is expecting LAN on VLAN, uh, what is it again? 90. So I'm going to put, I'm going to say this SSID, set it on the wired, going from the AP to the switch on VLAN 90. Uh, advanced settings. So see, we do have 2.4 and 5 gig for this. I personally recommend you leave it as is. I'm not a fan of those that would do LAN 2.4 and disable 5 and then create another one called LAN 5 and just enable five, right? I'm just broadcast that SSID on both 2.4 and five and let the solution make the decision on 
which uh, on which uh, band it will be 2.4 or 5 and in a second I'll show you there is a place where you can decide to force 5 gigahertz or prefer it or you know there is load balancing sort of that you can ask the AP to do which we'll do in a second here you do have other things that I'm not going to touch on security we'll do them in a second um, there are features that I prefer to personally prefer the firewall to do like content filtering I'll be like yeah sure I have the firewall do it that doesn't bring much to do it at the access point level in my opinion especially if you have a sonic wall firewall to do it but I personally think those two are quite nice capture ATP which is the sandboxing from sonic wall and cloud antivirus so those two will bring value that the firewall cannot bring simply because the firewall is at your gateway right it will not do any security for within the same subnet right here i'm creating a ssid called lan that i will dump on the lan where all workstations are so if i turn on capture atp it will do sandboxing for stuff within the lan which the firewall will never see because it's the same subnet right you don't have to go through your default gateway to reach the LAN because, well, you're already on LAN VLAN 90, which is exactly where workstation are at the same time. So those are, I believe, nice to add, which we will do in a second. Uh, guest portal, it's the LAN, so no need for that. So pretty easy, just hit save. So we have our LAN done. Next, we will do uh, VoIP, so click on add here be careful don't pick that one because it will add a ssid group which will contain ssids we already have our group here so we'll want to we want to add ssids within that group so plus here let's call it voip oh you do have ear client layer 2 isolation which could be nice right especially for the guests we'll turn it on for guest wi-fi that what that does is it prevents a wireless device to talk to another wireless device. So that's great into a guest Wi-Fi. So you don't have one guest trying to poke around with the with another guest uh, laptop or uh, mobile device. But for LAN or VoIP, it might not be the best. Uh, I'm not a guru of VoIP, but I believe that two VoIP phone, when they want to talk to each other, they first go through the PBX and then they establish a communication directly. So if you turn on client layer 2 installation for a VoIP wireless network, well, you may have issues where two VoIP phones that are wirelessly connected cannot talk to each other. So not a good idea for a VoIP network, but I believe a good idea for um, a guess wireless. So name it VoIP, it's active, no schedule. Uh, here we'll do WPA2, we'll type in password and VoIP is VLAN 99. Advance, I have it on both, that's good. Security, I won't turn on. Any and guess, no need for guess. So pretty straightforward. Give it a SSID, mindful of the amount of client it's entered as a maximum here. Put the password and that's about it. Save. Let's add another one. I wanted warehouse. And I want password again. And warehouse is on VLAN 100. And last one I want to do is a guess Wi-Fi. So we can turn on client isolation here, no encryption, and it's on VLAN 200 if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, VLAN 200. Here we'll leave it as default. Security will turn that on in a minute and guest portal will do one. So you do have plenty of options. I personally like this one. So see here, um, you can do a customized splash page and here it's a well-made UI where you can change the text, the brand, the pictures, the logo. You have here the message. See here it's welcome to Sonic Wall free Wi-Fi. Well, you can change whatever you want. Welcome to my 
corp, Wi-Fi, whatever company you have, right? So you can change text, change everything. You can see how it looks on a laptop, how it looks on a tablet, how it looks on an iPhone. So it's quite nice. We'll just leave it as uh, default. We'll just bring it back to default, go back. We're well, not gonna change a thing here. And that can give you a nice guest portal. So we'll hit on save. So here we do have all our, all all of our four SSIDs. So if we go back into the AP policy, edit this, see, we do have all of them are here. One feature that I wanted to uh, show you guys, of course, APs are still offline because I haven't turned them on yet. They're not connected. Uh, something I wish that is into the global configuration like I showed you, but it's not. Uh, it's on the AP setting, so I guess eventually it will be changed, but it's something I like turning turning on as well. So edit the access point, go into radio here, see, band selection. So you have here it's going to operate on both, but here see band steering. So disable, that means if the device wanted to connect on 2.4 or 5, well, so be it. Uh, Auto will be roughly kind of at half and half, where the access point will force half the people on 2.4 and the other half on 5. Prefer will do most of them, I would say like three quarters of the devices on 5 gig and the, the remaining a little bit on 2.4, but personally I prefer force 5 because 5 gigahertz has way less interference, way more available challenge, a cha cha channel to use. So I really like force on five. And also here, uh, radio band here on 2.4, strongly advised to force 20 megahertz. That because if you do uh, 20 megahertz, that give you four, uh, three channel that are usable, which I strongly suggest you turn this on here. So AP will use channel one, six and 11 only. It will not try to use like channel four and mess up with, and do interference with everyone on six and 11. But if you do 40 Hertz, then it takes exactly two thirds of all the frequencies that are available. So you will do interference with, for instance, if you pick channel one, you'll, de you'll do interference from channel one to channel six, which is really not optional, optimal. So pick 20 uh, megahertz, turn on one, six and 11 only. If you do have a large deployment, you may want to be mindful of, let's say you have 10 access point or 20 access point. Personally, I think it would be great that all the access point broadcasts on five gigahertz, but you could pick and choose which one will broadcast on 2.4 because keep in mind there is only three channels that are available so if you do have in a not so big environment 20 access points that are all broadcasting of course many will be on the same channel right you only have three that are accessible so you may want to pick and choose and make sure that you don't end up with uh, 20 access point and where i don't know seven will be on channel one which will all fight with each other could be a mess so um something to be uh, mindful of. Then here, personally, I think you can leave it to auto. There is stuff you can play with. Of course, the more uh, megahertz you pick, the better the performance you'll get, but the less channel will be available. So it's always depending on what you need. So to be honest, I always left it to auto. Maybe again, I'll do a uh, advanced video later on, on the, uh, on the access point with you know more advanced features and recommendation. But generally, get running, like hit the ground running, simple, has to work quick. That's usually what I do. So hit OK. And unfortunately, you need to do it on every access point. So not much of a big deal. Force 5, 20 Hertz, 1, 6, 11. AP ear. Force 20, like this. And last access point whoops here force 20 1, 6, 11 only and i think i've done it four times okay the other thing remember i showed you uh into the ssid policy i did add the option for security to turn on capture atp which is sandboxing and cloud antivirus so let's turn that on and that would be into security and security 
policies. So we're into access point, click on the plus button. We'll name it capture ATP, it's capture ATP. It is enabled. Block until verdict is something I like a lot because if this is a never seen before file, so no one at SonicWall, not a single SonicWall customer worldwide have seen it on the firewall, the access point, the switch, the Office 365 security, our cloud firewall, every single SonicWall product pretty much use Capture ATP. So if the file has never ever been seen worldwide, the, the access point will kind of hold to the file and not deliver the file until it finished scanning. It's a great feature, but if you don't tell anyone about it, they might find it annoying because you're trying to transfer something, it kind of hang and doesn't work. So again, great feature, but something to discuss with management and tell employees and test directly what it does and so forth. So for now, we'll just leave it off here. Uh, decide what file type you want. Of course, all of them on all those protocol. You could have exclusion if you want, but that's pretty much it. So click OK. Then we'll add another one for the antivirus, which is cloud called CAV, cloud antivirus. Again, put whatever name you want. It's enabled maximum file size of one meg, uh, five meg, and seems to be the max, all files, all files, no exception. Easy enough. And then let's turn this on our, on our access point. So we go into the SSID and we just turn it on on all the SSID, capture ATP this one, cloud EV this one, and save. And of course you do need this feature to be licensed, right? So I'm just going to turn it on, but uh, not going to care much if it's licensed or not. The goal is to show you how to do it. Um, not a unboxing or sales licensing uh, video, right? Just how to set things up. So turn it on, turn it on. And same here. Of course, you don't have to turn it on on everything. So maybe, you know, some companies have politics where they really don't care what yes people do. And if they get infected, they couldn't care less. It's not their device. It's really your call right <laughs> you you do what you want with those here i'm just gonna you know leave it off for demo purposes and see here we see things that are grayed out and things that are not so we know which one are turned on and again if i go in my ap policy we'll see here with those little green dot what is turned on so now let's connect those access point and test Okay, so here we do have our access point. They got one, two, three, and four. Of course, better placement would give you better coverage, but here it's just uh, for demo purposes, right? So here we do have all the cables for all those access points. So I'm just going to connect them to port four, five, six, seven, eight. No, five, six, seven, eight on the, um, on the switch. And as you can see, they are powering on with those little um, blue LEDs showing up here. So let's go back on the machine and see what's going on. Oh, we have one already online. See here, showing offline. Online, if I hit refresh, maybe we have one more. Maybe that's the first one I have connected. I don't know. Let's see here, IP it got 10, 10, 10. 219. So it's the 101010 10, 10 subnet, which is my VLAN 10 on my switch, which is X2 in the firewall, which is my management network. So we got those, we got three AP so far that are running. The outdoor one is still powering on. And like everything, what is the very first thing you do on a new product, whatever it is, you update the firmware. So see here, it's very convenient. See, I do have some exclamation or a I wear that blue thing there. And if I put my mouse over, new production firmware is available. See how nice it is. So let's say I pick the first one, my 621, click that small triangle here. I see I'm running 94669. And if I put my mouse over the access point, I do have upgrade. 
and we do see that the 600 series, the firmware is 96449, which is the exact same thing I have here. So that's why I do not have that small uh, blue thing there. But if we pick another one, the 681, see it's running 9640, where when the latest one is 9644. So what you can do, of course, if you are in a production environment, what I like is to update them one by one. So you pick one, you say that one, update the firmware. So you let the update, the firmware update, you let it reboot, you confirm it's back online, it's it's running, custom uh, devices are connecting to it. And then you move on to the second one. So that's something you could do throughout the day if you have enough coverage so that if one AP goes down, the other AP around will kind of take over and people will connect to them and you'll still have a decent coverage even though one AP is down. But here, since we are deploying them and it's the very first deployment, no one is connecting, then you select them all, you pick upgrade here and you select production firmware and you hit upgrade. So they will all update all at the same time, give or take. Um, but again, if you are in a production environment where people are connecting and you do it throughout the day, we'll do it them one by one so that one reboot and uh, everything is fine because you do one at a time and you have 20. So, you know, 19 out of 20 are functioning. That's enough coverage for everyone to connect. You wait for that one to be back online and you keep moving to the next one. Then we can hit refresh. Oh, see that question that blue thing is gone and we got that one remaining so eventually it will go away so now let's give it a quick try i will connect to different ssids and we'll see which ip i get so let's connect on lan password And I did get an IP for my adapter 101010, 10, 10, which, oh, no, that one, sorry, wireless. So wireless, I got 101090, 10, which is my LAN, that makes sense. So, so far, so good. Let's try VoIP. and do IP config again. And I got 101099. So I got on a different network, different VLAN on the switch and different interface on the firewall. And uh, let's try one last one. Password again. And I got 101100. And warehouse is yes, 10, 10, 100. So uh, access point are configured. Uh, let's hit refresh. So all my access point are now up and running. So a couple cool things we can look at. I believe it's ear, not ear topology. So see, now we can have we see our location, our devices, we, sh we see which client is connected to which access point. We can see it's this device, it's connected on the warehouse. If I go with more information, I can see I'm connected on 80 megahertz, I connected on the 5 gigahertz, and it's a 2x2, two two. How, how much data I've been connected. Uh, client journey, we can see on which access point I have connected to. So if you've been, you know, walking throughout the uh, floor plan or something, you, you can kind of follow where the user went, which is, I believe, kind of cool. Um, then air, air marshal, you can go here in RF survey, and it's gonna show you all the SSIDs that all of the access point are able to uh, actually see. And you can also like, you know, see here, acknowledge something so you can get alerts if something goes uh, bad. Here are all the devices that are around. Of course, I do see plenty of stuff from neighbors and things like this. 
Then if you go here, RF, R RF Spectrum, you do have even more stuff. So see, you can click on this. It's gonna show you, for instance, on 2.4, the different channel in use. Um, so that's kind of nice as well. Same for five. So there are some cool features in there as well. So I think that concludes that video on how to get basic step-by-step -step to get SonicWall access point working. So I hope you appreciate it and you like that video. So if so, give it a thumbs up or shoot me a quick email or subscribe, anything, right? Just let me know. So thanks for watching and see you in the next one.